Hello. This is Bad Bob the Astronomer. Uh, approximately 35 years ago, uh, I had a series of treatments by a therapist who used um, the Frimmer technique of deep muscle therapy. And that was it named after its inventor, Teresa Frimmer. That's spelled P-F-R-I-M-M-E-R. -M -M -E and her first name is Teresa with an E at the end. And I think her middle initial is C. And you can look it up on the internet using Google, using the Google, Google search engine if you want. And uh, um, the reason I'm making this video is a friend of someone I know uh, was asking me about the technique. So I thought I would, from my memory as a patient from 35 years ago, I'm just going to show, generally speaking, how the treatment was done. Actually, I could show you standing up, but generally the treatment is done in a relaxed, lying down position. Uh, uh, and uh, but what happens is. It's a form of deep muscle massage that's usually done with some kind of uh, lubricant like a, a, a baby, oil, baby oil or something on the skin to lubricate the skin a little bit to minimize friction. And uh, the massage is done with, the first few treatments are fairly light strokes. And then as a, uh, like a, I think I had approximately one treatment per week or maybe two. The next treatment the pressure would get a little bit stronger. On the uh, by the therapist pushing on my skin, so I can show you how it works. It basically works by a form of rubbing at right angles, like perpendicular, 90 degrees to the direction of the mus muscle fibers. Uh, now, if you look at my arm, uh, the muscle fibers in in the muscles of, of my arm, like the muscles normally go from the shoulder down to the wrist, and so the muscle fibers are in the same direction. So by stroking perpendicular to those muscle fibers, I would be, there's a whole group of muscles right on the top of the wrist, for example. And, and uh, the therapist said always work toward the heart, not away from it. So I'd start by a stroke like this and move up a, a small, about a half an inch or an inch and just stroke along like this. Work my way up like so. And then for the bottom, across like this. That's 90 degrees in a direction, 90 degrees, uh, each individual stroke, 90 degrees to the direction of the muscle fibers. Now, up in this part of the arm, there's a bicep, so I'd go like this. Actually, a smooth shirt, like a sort of a silky nature shirt, would probably offer enough lubricant just to start out. And then the tricep can be done like this. Still perpendicular, and then a shoulder like this, and then the shoulder blades like this. This muscle is very nice to have it done like that because that, that neck muscle can really get tense. And then I would do the other arm, and then for the area of the hand, there's sort of a muscle area there and around the thumb, so I could go across it like this. And then this thumb area can be done like this. I think they did the neck too like this, not too hard maybe the back of the neck. Now for the legs, the, similar to the legs, the are, legs are similar to the arms. Um, they can start off with the front of the leg by, by doing it like this. Start at the bottom and work toward the heart. There's a muscle mass that I'm doing right here that operates the foot up and down. Just go right up the thigh like this. You have to go right across a long ways. I'm not getting it very well. And then the back of the leg, like this, right across the calf muscles, right around like this, sideways. So my hand is, my leg is vertical, and my hand is actually stroking in a horizontal direction, like this. But I'm just slowly moving upward, like this. The same with the other leg. And the back, the back muscles are, uh, they go vertically like that, too. So I would be stroking across the back, like this. And then this, this side too, I can't reach over very well through my right arm, but you can see what's going on. And then, uh, of course, 
Uh, there's some of their muscles in other areas of the body, like, like the gluteus maximus and the back muscles. The stomach muscles, I forget how they did those, but it was just probably across something like this, but I'm not sure. It was 35 years ago. Something like this would probably do it. But that's basically it. I've given myself almost a complete body treatment um, just while you're watching in the video, just very lightly. Um, and uh, I think the face was done too, just stroking along the face, but I forget. There's one aspect of it that I don't think I like the, the treatment done too well. They, you could refuse it to have this done. They did something to the ear, something like that, that was supposed to you lose earwax, you loosen the earwax, but I don't like anything done to my ears at all like that. The same with my eyes. It was a massage right around the eye muscles that I didn't like too much. So you could just refuse to have anything done to your ears or your eyes. Uh, I didn't like that at all, so I thought I would mention it to you. So uh, any anything do doing with the ears, like earwax, it should be removed by a professional medical doctor, as far as I'm concerned. They have special solvents to remove earwax that plugs your ears up. I've had that done years ago, when earwax made me almost completely deaf one time. It was pretty easy to get it cleared out. It took a, a little while to dissolve it, but there was no danger to my eardrums. So uh, anything to do with the ears is not so good. So anyway, that's basically how it functions. It's pretty easy, you could see. And uh, um, if you want a, a, a list of the benefits by the Frimer technique of this deep muscle therapy, it's listed on their main website. And I, as I mentioned, you can find that with a Google, pretty easily with the Google search engine. I, in my, when I Googled it, it was the top uh, website right at the top of the list. And there are several other websites that describe how to do it. But the, one of the reasons I'm making this video is I looked through the video sections on YouTube and I could not see any video demonstrations of how it was actually done. So anyone that's curious to see what goes on, it, it's, 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 um, that's how it actually works. Um, I've heard um, stories about polio victims being greatly helped by this technique. One thing it's supposed to do is increase the blood flow in the muscles. So um, that can be very beneficial. So um, I don't think there's too, many da too much danger with it, but it, you know you have to be careful with all these techniques. So anyway, uh, that's about it. That's about all I really need to say about it. Uh, you can probably ask me any questions if you want, and I might respond to a question by putting another video on, an extra video on, so something like that. So, uh, and I might just type it in just like the usual way of doing it. So. Uh, Anyway, by this way, this background building looks a little odd. That's my astronomical observatory. It contains a 20-inch telescope. So I like to, uh, this is a very convenient place for me to, to make a video right now. So um, anyway, uh, maybe if there's any inquiries about my 20-inch telescope, I might show a video of that, showing how it works and things like that. But it's a 20-inch Gregorian telescope, and it's uh, got a, a final, uh, an equivalent focal length of around 500 inches and uh, the eyepiece location is only about four feet off the ground no matter where the telescope is aimed from the zenith along the southern meridian down to the, far, the as far south as the telescope will go so uh, it makes it very convenient and comfortable, comfortable to look through the eyepiece so uh, I may put a video of that on if anybody really wants to see it but it's it, it, it looks really like a, it's really a, a homemade type of thing and it's not very pretty to look at but it actually functions pretty well when you look through the eyepiece so uh, <coughs> the mirrors I ground and polished myself uh, during a well, well actually I started around the year 2000 to make the telescope and I just got it nicely functioning fairly well this summer I had a lot of mistakes I made with it and I had to do a lot of work to uh, get it to work properly, but uh, I had to figure out how to correct the mistakes. But I think I did fairly well, and it functions well enough for me to use just for simple visual observing uh, of galaxies and star clusters and nebulae and things like that. It works pretty well. I can use it, I used it on several glob on two globular clusters at 635 power uh, with a very wide angle eyepiece, and uh, I could see the planetary nebula, as far as I could tell, there's a planetary nebula that's listed in Burnham's handbook, and the uh, the size of the planetary nebula is approximately one arc second in diameter, photographic magnitude 13.8, and um, uh, it's called K 
1-800-648-6648. I'm not sure what catalog that exactly means, but that's the number that's given, that's the name of it that's given in Burnham's handbook. And as far as I could tell, I could see that visually through the eyepiece of the telescope in, right in the northeastern quadrant of the globular star cluster M15, fairly close to the core of the cluster. And I could see it almost instantly. The other faint stars visible in the field of view had a little bit of a sparkle to them. But this looked flat. It just looked like it didn't have a sparkle, but it was about the same brightness. And I looked at it very closely and I could actually see the, a very small disk shape. Something like the Ring Nebula M57 looks through, looks like to my 20 power finder scope uh, that I use on the big telescope. So it looked very similar to that, so uh, only a lot fainter. But it was still very easy to see as far as I could tell. Maybe I made a mistake, but I don't think so. It, it just stood out very boldly, like as distinct from the other faint stars as soon as I saw it. So uh, anyway, I'm pretty sure I was looking in the northeastern quadrant uh, of the cluster. So I, I observed that by observing how the, because uh, the, the telescope has three reflections in it, it's kind of hard for me to keep track of directions sometimes when I'm looking through the eyepiece, but I observed the way the, the um, stars move through the field of view toward the west when the clock dry was turned off and I could distinguish east from west and I could distinguish north from south by how the telescope moved when I was using the declination manual slow motion control. So I'm pretty sure I was correct getting my directions properly. So anyway, I'm just rambling on about something you're probably not interested in, but I thought I should mention something about astronomy during an astronomy video. Well, anyway, I'll probably add some more videos sometime. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about the Frimmer technique anyway. Goodbye.